I tried to repair this ultrasonic cleaner, but ultimately I failed. The footage I gathered along the way was too good for the garbage though, so I thought I'd make this quick video without putting much effort into it. I always wanted one of these things, so I picked this up from eBay, listed as broken, but with a very convincing price. It's rattling ominously, and upon opening it up I found that the driver board was missing, but the heater and the thermostat, and most importantly of course the ultrasonic transducer, were still present. This is certainly not the original base plate. It must have been manufactured by the previous owner and it's a really good job, I think. A little bit of bird's nest cabling going on here. To start things off, I ordered an ultrasonic cleaning set from China, consisting of a 100 watts, 40 kilohertz driver board and a 50 watts, 40 kilohertz ultrasonic transducer. And there's a first question for you. Can we use the 40 kilohertz driver board with the 35 kilohertz transducer that is in the device right now? I don't know. I don't even know how any of this works. Let's try, I guess. Setting up my power meter to observe whether or not the 100 watts power rating of the driver board is heated. That sounded almost right, but with a 150 watt power reading I didn't feel comfortable leaving it on for a longer period of time. This time the power consumption went up to a maximum of 180 watts, so I think there's something going wrong. I'm now using alligator clips to connect the new transducer that was supplied with the driver board, and I'm about to let it run dryly. That's a set of two very bad ideas. Letting it run dryly for a couple of seconds might be okay, but using alligator clips to connect the transducer to the driver board has left some cracks in those terminal leaves. That's why I must strongly advise to not test your transducer with alligator clips. The system is underloaded of course, but that high frequency hissing sounds much more like a healthy ultrasonic cleaner than with the other transducer. Alright, no more guessing, let's do it properly. I'm going to use the oscilloscope to measure the exact output frequency of the driver board to determine how close it is to the 35 kHz of the other transducer. With a 100 ohm load resistor, I'm getting this untriggerable mess. I'm using my active differential probes for this measurement because I suspected that it's just a pulsed rectified mains voltage coming out of there. And that's something that I wouldn't want to connect to my oscilloscope ground, aka protective earth. Later, when I do the reverse engineering though, I find out that it's actually fully isolated, so no worries. With the actual transducer instead, I'm getting this shapely signal, the frequency of which I sadly don't remember, but I remember that it was closer to 35 kilohertz than it was to 40 kilohertz, which is great for my application.
Then I started reverse engineering the driver board and it couldn't be easier. Although I've got to admit I'm not quite sure about those output transformers or inductors. You never know how those are connected internally. Anyway, in the top left hand corner they are rectifying mains voltage and I double or triple checked those two caps. They are absolutely not between plus and minus as one would expect. In this section they are creating a so-called virtual ground. And this is a basic push-pull circuit to drive the L2 transformer. In a nutshell, as soon as the device is turned on, transistor Q2 gets conductive because of its base resistor and it sends a current through the primary windings of the transformer L2. In its secondary windings a current is induced that does two things. It drives the transducer and it's also coupled into the inductors L3 and L4. Those turn off Q2 and turn on Q1. Now the current flow through the primary windings of L2 is reversed and the whole process along with it. The circuit is oscillating. The frequency is set entirely by the transducer because if it inhibits current flow, none could flow through the coupling inductor L5 either. L1 could be an inductor for power limiting or it could be another transformer to be used in countries with different mains voltages. Knowing all of that, I tried a couple more times to combine the new driver board with the old transducer but it always failed. Finding the reason for that was easy, but a solution? No such luck. The wires are riveted to the transducer, because solder joints are easily coming apart in an environment with a lot of vibrations. Using the flimsiest power tool the world has ever seen, I didn't get them out. Using the next size power tool I had, a full-sized hand drill, I destroyed the terminals of course. And that got me really frustrated. I didn't even feel like filming anything. Then I decided to just remove the old transducer. Piezoelectric element. Electrode. Piezoelectric element. Done. I am not sure if these are supposed to look like that. Might as well be water damage, corrosion, that influences the performance of the transducer. That's more like it. This bottom piece seems to be at least glued in and it's certainly not coming out anytime soon. I'll just try to Loctite an M10 bolt in there and on that I'll mount the new transducer. As I already declared in the title of this video, this approach wasn't successful either. The driver board was drawing too much power and getting hot. Maybe I added too much weight to the transducer by leaving the old base in. 
but I just ditched the whole project. Couldn't be bothered to spend any more time on this. These are not the most expensive things in the world and I will surely be able to afford a new one someday. But maybe it was helpful to someone anyway, because when I wanted to look up some things, I found absolutely nothing on the internet. Let me know if so. Thanks for watching. See you soon.